Hello, everyone. I'm Minyong Kim. Uh, may I welcome you on the behalf of the London Mathematical Society to the first virtual ICM public lecture. Uh, this will be given by Jordi Williamson with the title Machine Learning as a Tool for the Mathematician. Please note that this session is being recorded, so if you do not wish to appear in the recording, keep your camera off. We would also be grateful if audience members remained muted during the event. Jordi Williamson works in representation theory, the mathematical theory of linear symmetry. He has made several fundamental contributions to the field, including his proof with Ben Elias of the kazan lustig conjecture uh, on positivity, his algebraic proof of the Janssen conjectures, and his discovery of counterexamples to the James and Lustig conjecture in modular representation theory. This last result came as a real shock to a whole community of researchers and has led to a shift of paradigms surrounding a number of old conjectures. For his work, Jordi has been awarded the Chevalier Prize of the American Mathematical Society, the European Mathematics Society Prize, the Clay Research Award, and the New Horizons Prize in Mathematics with Ben Elias. In 2018, he addressed the International Congress of Mathematicians as a plenary speaker. Jordi is currently director of the Sydney Mathematical Research Institute and professor of mathematics at the University of Sydney. Prior to coming to Sydney, he spent five years as an advanced researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn. In 2020, he had a special year. He led a special year on representation theory at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. I should now like to hand over to Jordi to give his talk. If audience members have any questions, please could they enter them into the chat and after the lecture, we'll aim to answer as many as we can in the time allowed. If you have any queries about the event itself, please message Catherine here today as LMS privately in the chat. Jordi, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you very much, Mignon, for this introduction. And thank you also to the organizers for the opportunity to give this public lecture. Thank you also to the LMS for hosting us. Thank you all for coming, both online and in-person audience. We have had an ICM node here in Sydney and it's been extremely inspiring to see what's been happening around the mathematical universe. So today I'm talking about machine learning as a tool for the mathematician. So I love mathematics. I love the process of understanding. I love the process of discovering new mathematics. I love watching other people discover mathematics. And I love the vast array of different ways that mathematicians have of thinking about mathematical objects. I'm also fascinated by computing. I'm fascinated by what algorithms cannot can and cannot do. So over the last two years, I've been working with uh, DeepMind, which is an AI lab based in London on applications of mathematics, or sorry, of machine learning to mathematics. And I'm really fascinated by this work, not only it shows new possibilities in mathematics, but it also casts a very interesting light on the mathematical process. And that's what I'm going to try to communicate today in this public lecture. So over the last 15 years, we've seen dramatic advances in what machine learning can do. Tasks that were impossible when I was a graduate student, like recognizing an image or recognizing speech or generating images, et cetera are now possible for computers. One of the remarkable aspects of machine learning is that we don't tell the computer what to do, we tell the computer how to learn what to do. So I should emphasize that my background as a mathematician is as a representation theorist, so I'm very much a pure mathematician. And there have been incredible breakthroughs over the last 15 years using machine learning in mathematical modeling and applied mathematics. So I'm not going to be talking about this basically because of my own ignorance. So I'm talking about math, a machine learning 
predominantly for conjecture generation and refutation. So my talk will consist of two parts. In the first part, I want to explain what machine learning is and how it works, what artificial neural nets are, and I'll also talk about AlphaGo's work uh, on Go, on computer Go. Then in the second part, I want to give three applications of machine learning being used in mathematics. Okay? And along the way, I want to highlight the kind of light that this shines on the mathematical process. Okay, so let's start with what machine learning is good at. So here is a matrix of numbers. I want you to stare at this matrix and memorize it quickly for me. So if you have looked at this matrix, you'll notice that only numbers between 0 and 255 occur. And so we can ascribe to them a, a grayscale like a, a shade of gray. Okay. So the number zero would be white, 255 black, and all the numbers in between would be different shades of gray. Okay. If we do that, we get the following picture. It's still not recognizable what it is, but if we zoom out, we get the following picture. Now, I want you to look at this for a second and just notice how absolutely remarkable our visual capacity is. Without even thinking about it, you can see the whiskers, the eyes, the stripes. You can recognize immediately that it's a tiger. You can have some idea of where the tiger is sitting. Okay, this is absolutely instantaneous and effortless for us. But if you think about perhaps programming this on a computer, think about what the, what the computer, what the poor computer has to do. So So what I just showed you was a tiny bit of that image and we get this enormous matrix of numbers. Okay? And if we uh, if we compute on our computer we see that there's 10 million pixels in this image. So there's 10 million numbers between 0 and 255 and yet we're instantly able to process this information and ascribe it meaning. It's totally amazing. So I think that this example might convince you that it might not be so trivial to program such a task on a computer. So here's another example. So this kind of blew a lot of us away in the last two months or so. This is from DALI 2, which is an um, AI system from OpenAI. So all I did is type in with a friend an epic fight between a laptop, a lone tiger, and a compass oil painting, and then so this is all the computer gets, all the system gets, and it produces the image on the left. So this is a totally remarkable generative model. Okay. So now we go back to this question of how our brain processes this image. Now the short answer is we don't really know how it does it, but we know many clues. So what happens is we get some kind of visual input some visual input. This stimulates neurons, which reach the visual cortex, which is right at the back of our head. And then these neurons cause some kind of effect through the neural net sitting here, and we're able to process whiskers, tiger, stripe, etc. Okay. So here's a picture from Santiago Ramon y Cajal, one of the first neuroscientists of a neural network. So this is a picture of the neurons in the human brain. And Santiago Ramon y Cajal is a very inspiring figure. So when he was uh, a child, he wanted to be an artist. And his father basically forbade him from being an artist. And uh, he uh, became a medical man. And he was the first person to realize that the brain consists of individual neurons. Up until then, there was a conception that all of our nerves were continuous strings running around. So here's a neural net. So it's a whole lot of neurons all connected up together. If we zoom in, we see the soma, which is this thick thing, and we have these dendrites coming in. And so the picture is that charge comes into this soma, something happens, it feeds out charge to somewhere else, something happens. So it's this big network, iterative network. 
Now, what exactly happens when the charge comes into the soma is a big kind of important question in neuroscience, and it's very complicated. So there's, uh, so the, the first important thing to know is just that there's a, a non-linearity going on. So nothing happens until charge reaches a particular action potential, and then something happens, and what happens is very complicated. So it has a temporal aspect, uh, new, different neurons behave in different ways, there's probabilistic, something probabilistic going on, it's very complicated. But that basic picture that nothing happens until a particular uh, charge is reached and then something happens is what is very important for what follows. So if we zoom back out, so here's another picture of Ramon y Cajal, this time of the brain of a cat. And this is meant to be a picture of a, a larger scale neural net. Okay, so our brain has 86 billion neurons or something like that. And it's remarkable though, this picture that we get of that modern neuroscience gets, that we have these units which are basically deterministic, well, not deterministic, but we understand them well, and then consciousness is some kind of emergent phenomenon out of this. It's totally amazing. So if you're a computer scientist or a mathematician, you're tempted to find a simple model of what a neuron might be. And this is given by the perceptron, which was first made in 1958. So Here's our crude picture. We have inputs X, Y, and Z. They're added up. And then we take the max of zero and that number. So if the number is positive, we keep the number. If the number is negative, we replace it with zero. Okay. So this is just meant to be the crudest possible imitation of this observed fact that nothing happens and then something happens. Okay. And another observed fact about neurons is that different neurons have different levels of effect on other neurons. So we encode this by weights. So in this picture on the left, we see this dark line coming in from the Z and the, the weight on the Z is seven, which is kind of saying that the stuff coming from Z is more important than the stuff coming from X. And in what follows, I'll encode the weights of the neurons by the, by the thickness of the arrow. So this is the perceptron. And all we do is shift the, so, you know, mathematically what happens is we, we shift the point at which this fires and we shift the gradient of this firing. So there's two parameters here that we can muck around with. These are called the weights. And this is what an artificial neural network is. We just plug a whole lot of these together and form a network. So this is an artificial neural network, but how do we train an artificial neural network? So one should think about this picture that I've drawn here as a kind of tabula rasa, blank slate. And what we're now aiming to do is to fiddle with the weights of the neurons in order to achieve a particular, in order to do a particular task. Okay, so here I want to show you a neural net training. So this is a simple task. So the task is on the right hand side. So the reality, the thing that the neural net is trying to mimic are these blue and orange dots. And what is coming out of the neural net is the shading. So the blue and orange dots, so we're looking on the right hand side, the blue and orange dots do not change. What will change is the shading. And the, the first time I run this, I just want you to watch what happens with the shading. So you've seen that initially the shading had no correlation with where the blue dots are, but then the neural net trains and we get um, something that's now doing extremely well. You basically blue dots are where blue shading is and orange dots are where orange shading is. So for the mathematicians amongst us, what we're doing is we're learning a function. So the, the orange bit is where the function is negative and the blue bit is where the function is positive. Okay, so now I want you to, whoops, uh, I'm just going to show you the training again, but this time I want you to watch what happens on the neuron. So you can see, so this is our blank slate neural net on the left-hand side, and you'll see that, so the initialization of the neurons is, is basically random initially. There's some initialization scheme, and then you'll see as we train, 
the li some lines get thicker, some lines get thinner. And this is fiddling with the weights of the neural net. Here we see it again. This time it takes a little longer. And you'll notice that each time it converges to a different answer. So th there's, there's randomness right through this. There's randomness in the way that the network is initialized and there's randomness in the way that it trains. And th so the result is, has some ran randomness to it. Here's a more complicated task. And for a more complicated task, we typically need a more complicated neural net. And so you can see that we've taken more neurons. We've made our neural net larger. And you can see up in the top left, the um, number of epochs. So the number of epochs is measuring how many times have we wiggled uh, the weights of neurons. Okay, so I'll let it train again. Okay, you can see, so this is a harder task and so training takes longer. And you can see many facts that seem to mimic human learning experience. So one thing that you notice is that you often have long periods of, so you can see how it's doing in the output. So those two lines are measuring how accurate the network is. And you can see that you have these long periods where nothing is happening. And then we've suddenly seen an improvement. And you'll also see sometimes the, the network gets a little bit worse in order to get better, which is also something that I think uh, we experience as humans when learning new tasks. Okay. And you can keep this running for a while and you can see it's still doing, still getting slowly better. Okay, so there we, we just saw it got worse and to, in order to get better, etc. Okay. And you can run this uh, a number of times and you'll always get a different result. Also, this is a wonderful little neural net play playground. Um, so you can play with this. There's a link at the end of the talk um, if you want to play with this further. Okay. So that's a picture of artificial neural nets and how we train them. And if you want to know the kind of mathematical details of how we train them, it's calculus and linear algebra that we teach in first year. Okay, so I've been employing this analogy with kind of human learning, and it's very important to know that a, that a brain is not an artificial neural net in the same way that a bird is not a plane. And I have a very good friend, um, a neuroscientist in Singapore, who tells me that the attitude in neuroscience is that a neuron is perhaps like a feather. So it's something very beautiful that evolution has produced, but may not be essential for learning. So just a brief history of this subject. So in 1958, the first trainable perceptron was built, had several AI winters. And in 2006 was the first time that neural nets became the best algorithm on a task which is widely regarded as important. So this was on um, image recognition tasks. And in the 2010s, it's become industrial strength technology and nowadays you've probably used it a few times today without realizing it. Another thing that I want to point out here is that it's a very good advertisement for fundamental research. Okay, So this took 50 years uh, before it became something that um, one can make money from. Yeah. The, the other very interesting point here is I remember when I was a graduate student, uh, there was someone in our department that was very excited about neural nets, and this was about 2006. And I remember him explaining them to me and trying to get me excited. And I was totally unexcited because I thought there's no way that this simple linear algebra can produce something interesting. And so what I totally underestimated is just what happens when you make these neural nets very large. And that's what we've discovered in the last decade or so. So I've been describing neural nets as something that solves problems which were typically difficult for computers, but humans find easy. So things like image recognition and speech recognition and perhaps generating an image of something. But it's a very interesting question as to whether neural nets can solve hard problems. So I think the first really convincing evidence that this was possible occurred in uh, 2016 in the game of Go. So here's a picture of the Go board. So this is the 
probably the oldest continuously played board game on earth. It was first played about two and a half thousand years ago in China. So players alternately lay white and black, st black stones on this board. And it's enormously complicated. So if you think about chess as a complicated game, chess has about a uh, number of atoms in the earth board positions, whereas Go has vastly more board positions than there are atoms in the known universe. So it's an enormously complicated game. And when I was a graduate student, I also had a colleague who is a, one of the best European Go players, nothing compared to the East Asian Go players, but he spent many hours convincing me that computers would never play Go. So there was this famous match between Lee Sedol, who is on the right, and the DeepMind AlphaGo system. And this match was remarkable for many reasons. So the first reason is the computer won. So this was the first time in history that a computer had beaten a, a, a good player, you know, even a reasonably good player at Go. Uh, the second beautiful thing about this story, so there's a really beautiful documentary about this on YouTube, which I would recommend, is that Lee Sedol won the fourth game. So the match was won by AlphaGo four games to one. Lee Sedol won the fourth, fourth match. And if you watch the documentary, it's really like a redemption for humanity when Lee Sedol wins the, the fourth game. It's really beautiful. Another remarkable thing about this is that afterwards, um, DeepMind developed a new a uh, piece of software called Alpha Zero, which has no knowledge of human history of the game. So it just learns to play entirely via self-play and even ends up beating AlphaGo. But what I found most remarkable about this match was happened in the second game in this famous move 37. So this is the, um, the board in the second game, and move 37 is the black stone in the middle on the right. And I'm not an expert on Go, but people tell me that this was a really shocking move from the point of view of human common knowledge about Go. So it really contradicted wisdom about what one should do in a Go game. So it's really beautiful in the documentary when this, when this move is played, you can see Lee Sedol's face and he has this mixture of amusement and skepticism and suspicion on his face. And he leaves and he takes about 12 minutes to respond to this move. And he loses this game convincingly. And in the press conference afterwards, he says, yesterday I was surprised, today I'm speechless. So I think when mathematicians saw this, I certainly thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try to play something like move 37 in mathematics? I should emphasize that mathematics is very different to Go. And uh, a, a correct analogy maybe for mathematics kind of doing well at Go would be something like mathematics solving Go. You know, it's not good enough for us to play better than better than anyone else. We actually want to solve it or something like that. So it's an interesting challenge. And I also found out that this thought about kind of playing move 37 in mathematics was like very unoriginal. So essentially every mathematician that I spoke to who, uh, who followed this game essentially had the same idea. So before I discuss the, the possibilities of machine learning in mathematics, I just want to discuss briefly what mathematicians do, because I think there's some misconceptions about what we do, even by people in neighboring fields. So the first question that one often gets at dinner parties is, isn't it all already known? So here's a picture of the Great Barrier Reef, which is one of the wonders of the world that is currently suffering greatly due to climate change. And when people ask me, you know, isn't it all known? This seems just as crazy to me as looking at the Great Barrier Reef and thinking that you understand everything about all the processes going on. You know, the Great Barrier Reef is this incredibly rich ecosystem, and so is mathematics. We understand very little of what is going on. The other question that people ask is, can't you just plug it into a computer? So there's a famous conjecture in 
in mathematics known as the twin prime conjecture, which asserts that there's infinitely many prime numbers that are two apart, like 11 and 13. And this is very closely related to the work of um, James Maynard, who received the Fields Medal two days ago. And even in this problem, you see the limitations of computers. Sure, you can check for many, many numbers that there's a lot of prime numbers that are two apart, but you need a real idea to show that there's infinitely many such numbers. And even on finite problems, computers have great limitations. So as kind of lay people, we're currently amazed, we're, we're kind of constantly amazed by the power of computers. But I think as computer scientists and mathematicians, we're often struck by what they can't do. So there's very simple search problems which computers just cannot do because our computers are nowhere near big enough. And one of the things that's very interesting in machine learning is it may offer a possibility to search much more effectively in many situations. This is another very important point, um, which is that mathematicians want to understand often rather than prove or compute. So there's, a, there's another conception of mathematics that it's all about kind of theorem and proof. And there's a very famous article of um, Thurston, which I'll quote from in a second, which emphasizes that the primary goal of, the, of mathematicians is to produce understanding for other mathematicians. It's a very interesting point of view. So here's a quote from Emmy Noerta, one of the great 20th century mathematicians. If one proves the equality of two numbers A and B by first showing that A is less than or equal to B, and then A is bigger than or equal to B, it is unfair. Okay? I should emphasize, this is a totally valid proof, but Emmy Nertus is saying it is unfair. One should instead show that they are really equal by disclosing the inner ground for their, inner, their equality. So notice the aesthetic sense in it is unfair, and mathematicians often have this sense that there's an inner ground for two things to be equal. So what Emmy appears to be talking about there is a desire for understanding of what's going on. So this is from the article that I was discussing earlier. This is William Thurston, Bill Thurston, from this famous article on proof and progress in mathematics. What mathematicians are doing is finding ways for people to understand and think about mathematics. The rapid advance of computers has helped dramatize this point because computers and people are very different. For instance, when Apple and Harkin completed a proof of the four color map theorem using a massive automatic comp computation, it evoked much controversy. I interpret the controversy as having little to do with doubt people had as to the veracity of the theorem or correctness of the proof. Rather, it reflected a continuing desire for human understanding of a proof in addition to knowledge that the theorem is true. So I absolutely love this um, article. I think it's a fascinating take on what we do as mathematicians. So there's a joke which uh, people have often kind of mathematicians say to each other, which is that a kind of a co computer comes up to a mathematician and says, I've got a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And the mathematician says, great. And then the computer says, here it is, it's 7 billion lines long. And uh, I've actually kind of tried to think about what, how I would react to a, such a situation. And then I realized that such a situation has already occurred in the proof of the four color theorem. So the proof of the four color theorem re reduced the checking of a proof to the checking of 1700 cases that could never be checked by a human. So that situation has kind of, has already occurred. And it was interesting to see how we dealt with it. Okay. So it's a very important point that we seek understanding. So. Uh, in one of the projects with DeepMind, at some point we had a neural net that was getting the answer right essentially all the time. But that's not good enough for us. We need understanding as mathematicians. We, we, want, math, we want understanding. I just want to emphasize one other aspect of the uh, mathematical process, which is that we are very often stuck. And that a lot of the process of advancing mathematically has as much to do with kind of hunches and intuition and guesswork as it does to formulas and proofs. So the idea of us kind of rigorously sitting in our offices pursuing some 
line of reasoning that's guaranteed to succeed is totally wrong. So there's this beautiful quote from Claire Voisin from a very recent article called How to Make a Portrait of a Bird, where she discusses the mathematical process. It's a quote from it. There is the monastic introverted period where we were just contemplating the ocean of our ignorance, but then suddenly something happens. The monk becomes busy and excited in a hurry to look more closely at the detail. So inspired by Voisin, I tried to make the following map of the development of mathematical ideas. So this is just meant to give some impression to non-mathematicians of what it's like to work on a problem. So we spend some indefinite amount of time totally lost. And then we have an idea. And this idea leads to many kind of sprouts. And some of these sprouts lead immediately to a dead end. And some of them trail off and we give up because it just doesn't look promising. And then perhaps we're lucky and we find a route. Very often, this does not, we're just stuck and we've had an idea and we think it's a great idea. And we always think it's, you know, often I think this was a really good idea, but it just didn't get anywhere. It's a pity. But sometimes we're lucky and we get to a theorem and then this sprouts off its own um, shoots and is digested by the community and feeds into further theorems and further development. I should also emphasize, which is perhaps also not so understood by the layperson, which is that for many mathematicians, certainly many of my colleagues, computers play very little role in any of this. So perhaps if you're into experimentations on a computer, the, the computer may play some role at the beginning. And also in, in Kevin Buzzard's talk at this Congress, he's discussing the role that computers could play at the end of this process when we're checking proofs, informal proof verification. But for many mathematicians that I know, computers play very little role. And I think it's very interesting to think where computers can help in this process. And certainly in the work with DeepMind, we, we somehow use computers very much at the beginning of this process, but when it came to proving, um, the mathematicians were on their own. I should also say that this whole discussion of what mathematical life is like is very much personal, and I'm very aware that there's many different experiences out there. I'm just trying to give some impression um, from my own experience and from those of others. Okay, so now I want to discuss three examples of machine learning and mathematics. So I'll discuss examples from not theory, representation theory, and graph theory. So the first example is from not theory, but before I give you the example, I just want to remind you that mathematics is an enormous subject and consists of many fields. And no one person knows all of mathematics. And there's a beautiful quote from Miriam Mizakani, where she says, I like crossing the imaginary boundaries set up between different fields. It is very refreshing. So most mathematicians are specialists. They work in their own area. And most most uh, progress also comes from specialists working on their own, in their own area. But sometimes there's cross-fertilization, which is very interesting. And also sometimes we put up these imaginary ba barriers that, um, that Mizakani is talking about. So now we come to this work in knot theory. So here is uh, a knot. So for a mathematician, a knot is very similar to what a lay person's knot would be. We tie a knot in a piece of rope and then we fuse the ends together. So we don't know where the beginning and end of the knot is. Okay. So here's a mathematical knot. And knot theory is one of these fields that has very rich interactions with many other fields. So it has very rich interactions with three and 4D topology, three and four dimensional topology. So for example, if we want to know what three and four dimensional spaces are out there. This is very closely related to some questions in knot theory. 
Also, going back to the work of Thurston, there is a remarkable connection with hyperbolic geometry. So in topology, you cannot make measurements, you cannot tell angles or distances. But what Thurston explained to us is that for many knots, the complement has a unique um, geometric structure. So we can start to measure things like distance and volume and angles and that kind of thing. And it also has connections to many other fields, to quantum topology, to mathematical physics, etc. Huh? Now, in knot theory, an enormously important role is played by invariance. So these are some kind of measurement of the complexity of the knot, some kind of measurement of a topological property, or something that is rather mysterious still. So um, here's a whole list of invariants that we can associate to a knot that are very useful, for example, for telling two knots apart. So these invariants are often kind of tied to a field in which they're born. So signature, for example, is born in the uh, topological study of knots. Alexander polynomial is also from topology. Hyperbolic volume is from um, hyperbolic geometry. The Jones, Homflip, and A2 polynomials are from uh, quantum, quantum topology. And there's many, many others. Now, if we, the other thing that I should have emphasized before is that the, like knot theory and 3 and 4D topology is an enormous subject. So there's hundreds of researchers that work in that area. There's hundreds of researchers that work in hyperbolic geometry and similarly in the other areas. So Mark Lackenby, um, when he talks about this work, he points out that it's possible to find conferences in these areas that have entirely disjoint participants. So I think it's interesting to ask, do there exist unexpected relationships between these invariants, both because that's an interesting question in itself and because it may suggest um, interactions between these fields. So this is what, uh, the first project that I'm talking about was looking at. So this involved knot theorists, Yuhash and Lackenby, and machine learning experts from DeepMind, Davies and Thomasen. So on the left, you see a plot of um, hyperbolic invariance in the left hand, in the x-axis, against signature, which is a topological invariant in the uh, y-axis. And this is across a whole lot of knots. And you can see, even in this simple plot, that something's going on. But how do you decide exactly what is going on? So what these researchers did was they fixed some topological invariant, namely the signature. And then they tried to train a neural net to predict the signature from a whole slew of hyperbolic, hyperbolic, hyperbolic invariants. So on, in the right-hand picture, you see a whole lot of hyperbolic, well, mostly hyperbolic invariants. And uh, you try to predict the signature from these invariants. And what is interesting, so this model got good accuracy. So it got 70% accuracy, I think. But also the error was not too bad on the, on the ones that it was getting wrong. So it's clearly picking up on something. But then there's a way of looking at your machine learning model and seeing what aspects of the input were decisive in making the prediction. And that's what the bar chart on the right-hand side says. So these top three elements were much more significant in making the prediction than, than for example, the adjoint torsion degree at the bottom, whatever that is. Yeah. So what Davies, Yuhash, Lackenby, and Thomas ever able to prove, so in the bottom, you have two times the signature of the knot minus the slope of K. So this is an invariant that they introduced, which uh, is some combination of um, those, the first entries appearing in the, in the top right-hand graph. So this is a new invariant um, of a, a, a new combination of invariants of the hyperbolic knot. And they show that the difference between these two measurements coming from different fields is bounded by some constant times the volume and the um, injectivity radius to some power. Okay. So I think that this is very interesting as an approach to kind of connecting fields. So I should emphasize that what you can kind of plug into these models is extremely flexible. It doesn't have to be 
numbers or polynomials that can also be a wide variety of mathematical objects. So our second example comes from representation theory, which is my field. So again, before we turn to representation theory, I want to emphasize that the symbols that we draw in mathematics are not the ideas that we see. So one way of thinking about this is to imagine a musician's relationship with a music score. So it's necessary to have the music written down in order to learn the piece. But once the musician has learned the piece, it lives in their mind in a much richer way than it does on the paper. And it's exactly the same for us as mathematicians. So here's a quote from one of the great um, living mathematicians, Pierre Deligne. I don't remember statements that are proved, but rather I try to keep a collection of pictures in my mind. So you could imagine a musician saying a very similar thing. So often in the application that I want to discuss in a second, it's really a problem of finding the right picture. So uh, a colleague explained the following beautiful analogy to me. So if you think about animals, they have a vast spectrum of different ways of understanding their environment. So birds, for example, some birds are uh, sensitive to electromagnetic field and some prawns or shrimp can see much larger chunks of the visual spectrum than we can. And I feel somewhat similarly with some of my colleagues. Some of my colleagues have a very rich geometric in intuition. Some of my colleagues have a very symbolic intuition. Um, so this task, this, um, this application is in representation theory. So this is the study of the building blocks of linear symmetry. So what we focused on are these things called kajdan lipstick polynomials. So these are incredibly important um, and subtle measurements of these things that we call representations, which are kind of building blocks of linear symmetry. So if you think about the analogy with the periodic table, so the, the, the building blocks that we think about are like the atoms. And the Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials are telling us how these atoms fit together to form molecules. So they're like atomic numbers of mathematical structure. So I just want to show you a video. So here's a video of the development of certain Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials. And you can see that they get incredibly complicated and beautiful. So you can think about this as some description of some enormous molecule. And there's many, many patterns in Kajdan-Lutzig polynomials that we can observe, but we can't explain. There's many mysteries. So there's a uh, conjecture in representation theory called the combinatorial invariance conjecture, which is over 40 years old, which is the statement that to a pair of permutations, whatever that is, so we can firstly associate a Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial. So that's this thing on the right-hand side. But we can also associate a much more kind of, it's, it's more complicated object, but it's much more elementary. It's kind of very directly related to X and Y. And that's this Bruja graph. So you have something that's very directly related to, uh, to X and Y, but is complicated. And then you have something that's very subtly related to X and Y as some kind of very fundamental measurement of X and Y. So if you want an analogy, the Bruja graph is a little bit like the image of the tiger and the Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial is like the judgment, you know, it is a tiger, it has whiskers, etc. And this is actually what I was imagining when I suggested this project to DeepMind. I was imagining what, hap what, would, what would I be like if I'd grown up in a world in which I encountered Bruja graphs all the time and I played with them and you know, I had tremendous intuition for them? Would I just be able to immediately see the Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial from them? So what we did was we, we trained a neural net to take in a Bruja graph and spit out a prediction for the Kajdan-Lutzig polynomial. And um, again, this is a setup where you can generate a very large number, a large um, amount of data very easily. And we got 
it was kind of totally shocking for me. So within three days, so we had our we had some time to set up the training data and stuff, and then the 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 neural net started training. But within three days, the DeepMind researchers wrote to me and said we're getting like 97% accuracy, 98% accuracy, and then with some tweaks, at some point we got like 99 point something accuracy. Okay. So it really suggests that you know, had I grown up in a world in which I was surrounded by Bruja graphs, I would just be able to immediately see the Kajal Lipsic polynomial. What is more interesting, I think, in this story, so this comes back to the point that I was trying to make before, that we really seek understanding, is that we were able to look at the model and do a very similar technique to what I discussed in the knot theory, which is, in some sense, to look at where the model is looking. So this is called saliency analysis or attribution. And what this did was point out certain remarkable substructures in the Bruja graph that I had not observed before. And that process took a long time and was based on this um, graph in the bottom right, which was saying that certain edges, so in the graph on the left, these are the, the edges with the blue dots are kind of much more important than the rest of the graph. So that led us to the following conjecture which is still a conjecture, we can prove it in many cases, but it's a conjecture still, which is that for any, so we're trying to predict the term on the left, this is essentially the cousin elliptic polynomial, and uh, we can express this as a sum of two terms. Now, the, the right-hand term, this is very well understood by experts. If I show this to experts, this makes total sense, whereas the middle term is very mysterious. And what's interesting here is that the middle term is exactly what came out of the machine learning model. So it's really like you kind of have computer plus human in this formula. So the last um, example that I want to give comes from graph theory, comes from the work of Adam Salt Wagner. But before we get there, I again want to remind you of something about the mathematical process. So here are the two very famous papers from the 20th century. So the left-hand one is the paper that gave rise to the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, one of the most important conjectures in number theory. And on the right-hand side, we have the paper that led to the Hodge conjecture or popularized the Hodge conjecture. So as you'll see from the first three lines on the left-hand side, this the conjecture, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture was arrived at by some of the first uh, extensive computations on electronic computer. Uh, whereas, yeah, the conjecture on the right, the Hodge conjecture has very different, different origins. I just want to emphasize that a lot of mathematical endeavor is structured around webs of conjectures. So if you have this point of view of mathematics as being theorem and proof, it doesn't explain the fact that we have been obsessed with certain proofs for long periods of mathematical developments, with certain conjectures for long periods of, of, of our development. And that these conjectures often form kind of uh, lighthouses for our navigation in a field. So both of these conjectures have had an enormous effect on their field. So I want to give two quotes about uh, mathematical conjectures. So the first one is from Richard Taylor, who's a famous number theorist. And he writes, in my field, we suspect what is true long before we can prove it. So number theory is kind of littered with these conjectures that no one, no one can prove. And some of these conjectures, like the Bertrand's Winter and Dyer conjecture, are beacons. A second quote is from, from Gromov. He's talking about Ramsey theory, and he says, to conjecture it is remarkable. Once you conjecture it, you prove it. Okay? Which is another situation in some fields of mathematics, that just finding the right statement is the, is the difficulty which also challenges this kind of theorem proof view of mathematics. Okay, so now we come to graph theory. So on the left is a, um, is a graph. So this is a collection of nodes or vertices and edges between them. And graph theory is a very rich subject with many relations to other fields of mathematics and also to computer science. And one of the fascinating things about graph theory is that the kind of space of all graphs with even a small number of vertices is enormous. 
So the number of graphs on 26 vertices is roughly like the number of atoms on Earth. And the graph on the left that I've displayed has about 45 vertices, which means that it's absolutely impossible for us to ever write down all graphs with 45 vertices. So this is larger than the number of board positions in Go, which in turn is much larger than the number of particles, the number of atoms in the universe. So I am not a graph theorist, but researchers in graph theory tell me that there's certain conjectures in graph theory that have, have a sense of being extremely deep statements about graphs. But there's others that just don't feel right, but you can't find a counterexample to. So some conjectures are true and some are just false and you can't find a counterexample. So there was this remarkable work of Wagner where he set up the following situation. So he fixes the number of vertices of the graph, like you'd fix 45 on the left-hand side. And then you imagine a game in which you give the computer each possible edge. So you say, do you want this edge? The computer says, yes. Do you want this edge? The computer says, no. And you continue through and then you build a graph in this way. And then you, so you're, you're looking for a counterexample to something and you want that there's some numerical quantity that measures how far away you are from being a counterexample. So you do this a thousand times and then you took, you take the 5% the of best possible, best plays of this game, okay? Where let's say a certain number was lowest at the end of this game. Now you update a neural net based on those 5% uh, of best played games and try to make it more likely that if you played a game according to this neural net again, it's more likely to produce the, the top 5% that you just did. So you kind of, you play a thousand games, learn, play another thousand games, learn, play another thousand games, learn, et cetera. So I just want to illustrate this. So he, he showed that this method gives counterexamples to several statements in combinatorics. So here's an example of such a statement. So this is a conjecture which I believe is about 20 years old. Uh, and I'm not saying at all that these conjectures are important, but I think the message is the, the method is very interesting. So here we have a conjecture on graphs. And I'm not explaining what the terms are. The important thing is that the conjecture says that an inequality holds. So you can easily measure how close you are to a counterexample, namely, you take the left-hand side minus the right-hand side. Now, I want to show you an animation. So this is from the, so what I'm showing you is an animation which shows you one instance of the game played after every learning round. So what you're seeing is the neural net slowly learning how to get better at potentially producing counterexamples. And if you plug this graph in, it is a counterexample to the conjecture. So here's another example. Again, we have a conjecture in graph theory. And again, I'm not going to explain what the terms mean. And again, the conjecture is an inequality. So we want to just minimize that term, whatever it is. And again, I'll show you an animation. So let me emphasize again that every single slide, so Every single slide that I'm showing you represents like a thousand games played, and then there's some update of a policy, and then a new thousand games are played. Okay, and again, you see it converging to some kind of structure. So now, if you put this graph into a computer, it is not a counterexample to the conjecture. But at this point, something very interesting happens. You just stare at this graph and you say, well, there's some obvious things that I can experiment with here. You know, I could try putting more petals on, or I could try lengthening out these arms. And I think when you, one, one of these approaches works. So I can't remember which one it is, but I think if you lengthen out the arms, you immediately get a counterexample. Okay. So I hope that these, 
um, three examples have illustrated some uses, potential uses of machine learning as a tool for mathematicians. I just want to emphasize the following points. So neural nets were able to give us clues, but expert mathematicians were needed to follow up the clues. So in the Bruja graph project, for example, we got this clue about these subgraphs, but it took me about nine months to work out what was going on. So there's still a lot of human work involved. So this is a totally subjective personal opinion, but the insights gained from the neural nets were fundamentally different from intuitions and knowledge of the problem. It was suggesting a different avenue of research to what I would traditionally follow. I love this picture of intelligence as being a big space. And so we have various axes in this space. And my hope is that machine learning gives us access to a new axis of this space. And I'm very excited as to what will happen in the next decade. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, we have running a pretty tight schedule here, so we don't have too much time for questions. Um, I think I'm going to abuse my privilege a little bit as moderator and ask a question, Jordi, <laughs> if that's OK. Sure. Um, you said something, dropped a remark along the way, which forced me to ask or, or tempted me to ask this question. That does machine learning tell you anything about which conjectures are important? That's an extremely good question. So. I think the simple answer to that is no. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, in the knot theory project, my understanding is that that can be a new hash were presented with several, several statements. And some of them they thought were just, they, they already knew these were trivial. And some of them were um, kind of totally out of reach. And it, it really needed expert mathematicians to say like, this is interesting and potentially within reach of proof. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I think we may have time for one more question. Does anybody in the audience have, have some? Well, there were some things. There doesn't seem to be some things that were anything that's really compelling at the moment. Well, in that case, maybe we should wrap up after all. So I should say, um, uh, so. Uh, I do have to advertise a few things on the behalf of the LMS. The next virtual ICM public lectures will take place on the 11th of July, 2022. Elena Georgi will give a lecture on black holes, the mathematical enlightenment. And then on the 13th of July, Tadashi Tokieda will give a lecture on a world from a sheet of paper. So all are welcome to these events and further details can be found on the society's website. So in the meanwhile, uh, may I ask you to join me in thanking uh, Jordi Williamson on an excellent public lecture. And may I thank all of you for coming to this virtual ICM public lecture, which is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>